Joining me now in the studio is the author of the Senate bill that would make Minnesota Real ID compliant, Senator Eric Pratt. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to be here. How did we get here? The act was passed in 2005. It's 12 years later and we're still hung up on this thing. So what's going on? Well, um, you're, you're exactly right. The act was passed in 2005 and a number of states, not just Minnesota, had a problem with the federal government mandates. Uh, and also just a lot of uncertainty around what was being asked for. So Minnesota, along with several other states, passed bans prohibiting their, their state departments from investigating or implementing a real ID. Uh, now, as time went on, many of these states repealed those bans as they got, as more information came out from the federal government. Minnesota is one of the last ones to repeal the ban. So in 2016, we repealed the ban that allowed the department to at least evaluate what would be needed. Uh, now we're looking at, now that we know what would be needed in order to implement a real ID, now we're trying to actually get it implemented. In general, people are concerned about their ability to fly and travel mm -hmm. freely across the country. But why does the federal government need access to all of this information? Well, it's not about having access to the information. It's about making sure that the credential that you're presenting is in fact valid and meets certain standards. Um, they want to know that if you're flying, if you're entering a military facility, if you're entering a federal building, including the White House, um, that the credentials used to get the ID um, are credible because there's, there's one of the problems that the 9-11 the Commission found was that states varied in how they, how they validated someone's identification and they also said that um, they should be able to set the standards for what they're willing to accept uh, where they have jurisdiction. So they have jurisdiction on whether you enter a military facility, they have jurisdiction on how you enter federal buildings, and they have jurisdiction over commercial air flight. One testifier in last week's committee hearing compared complying with real ID mandates is similar to giving in to hostage takers. <laughs> uh, do you believe that the loss of privacy and the concerns about government overreach are compelling enough reasons to be against this legislation? Well, I think there are some concerns, but I think, first of all, we have to recognize that, in my opinion, we're not giving up a significant amount of information. We're not giving up a significant amount of privacy. The, departments, the Department of Vehicle Services uh, testified that we're not passing any information to a central database. We're simply going out to other states and seeing if another real ID exists in one of those states because by federal statute, you can only own one real ID. So if, for example, someone comes up from Iowa, then we would also ping and, and didn't present their, their real ID when they were applying for a new Minnesota license, we would want to know that Iowa had that and that it was closed before we issued our credential. Some so basically preventing people from having multiple exactly. identifications. Okay. Um, for, you know, for our immigrant population, those with uh, green cards here on legal status, uh, there's a requirement that we validate that legal status with Homeland Security. I think that's a fairly reasonable ask. Um, and then finally, you know, we're already providing information to other states. Um, when we revoke someone's driving privileges, that's available to any other state so that someone can't go to Wisconsin or Iowa and get a new driver's license when they've had their, their uh, privileges revoked here. So um, we're not passing off any information. We're, nobody else is housing any information. We're just simply doing checks against other databases to make sure that um, uh, we maintain the integrity of the identification. Well, and I think that's one of the areas that Senator Limmer is concerned about mm -hmm. because in terms of the protection of private data, it's only as strong as he said to me, it's weakest link. Mm -hmm. So if we are sharing information all around the nation and another state isn't as secure as our state, then this data is still available and there could be breaches. So how do you respond to that concern? Well, I mean, first of all, you think about the information that's being passed. It's just the information that's on the front of your driver's license. We're just trying to make sure that you don't have another ID in another state. They shouldn't be housing our information. Um, and, and we're not getting a lot of information back unless we get a hit. Um, so it's just a yes or no response the first time. So minimal information is really transmitting in these verification steps. Okay. Um, when the bill was before the Judiciary Committee, there was a lengthy debate that came up about the data surrounding, I think it 
it had to do with the firearm safety hunter education mm -hmm. because Minnesota driver's licenses will have that information on them. How does that translate to real ID and are there concerns that, you know, people's information about whether they have a license to carry or anything like that would be transmitted federally? Well, I think what we would want to do is protect, uh, to Senator Limmer's point, we want to protect that data under our state rules and regulations. We don't want that to become available to the federal government. So you could still have your hunter safety on your driver's license, but in the bill that I've got, it, uh, the Department of Public Safety would not be able to share that information with the federal government or any other state. That would be classified under our current um, data privacy rules, which makes it private. So there's some information that everybody will have access to, which is basically what you can see mm -hmm. on your license. And anything more private than that is, is protected. The other thing we've done in this bill is at the date of enactment, all the data sharing is locked in. And so if there are any changes from the federal government where they want more data, that has to come back to the legislature for our approval. Okay. And so we won't allow the department to just automatically give any new data without coming through the legislature. We, we are very, I've been very um, uh, sensitive to the, to the information that we are sharing and to make sure that we do are protecting residents' privacy. One last question. The House version of the bill has a controversial part that would codify that illegal immigrants cannot get driver's licenses. So if the bill gets to conference committee, how do you think that's going to go down? <laughs> well, I think we're going to have to wait to get to conference committee. Certainly, I've been talking with the speaker and the House author uh, as we were going through the process. Um, I think everybody realizes that this was the issue that got us hung up in 2016. And the Senate was a little more liberal than we are today in their rulemaking authority, and, and the House was unwilling to move. Um, I think what I've been trying to tell the House is we should treat immigration and we should treat real ideas two separate issues. And so my goal is to make sure that um, any laws and regulations regarding driver's licenses for undocumented immigrants will be the same after the bill as they are today. Senator Pratt, I want to thank you so much for coming thank you. today. Appreciate it.